hello and welcome to our Friday webinar. Uh, we are, let's see, what are we doing today? We're doing Avian Vet Insider, and this is a Cardiovascular Disease and Pet Birds Part 2 um, uh, with Dr. Stephanie Lamb. So welcome, Dr. Lamb. Thank you for joining Hi. us. Thank you. <laughs> and uh, the last, the part one was, was, was such a big hit that we've, we're doing a part two, and we've got plenty of questions for you, um, like a good list of questions. And if we have time for more questions, because we already have a lot of questions, if we have time for even more questions today, just everybody, uh, just a reminder to use the Q&A button. I'm sorry. Um, yes. And then not the chat feature. And then we can capture the new questions for today. <laughs> so, um, so, okay. Uh, so let's see. I think we have a bit of territory to cover today. It's an important topic. And uh, also just a quick reminder that if you did miss part one, it's on the, the YouTube channel, the Fever's YouTube channel. You can go back and watch it. So with that said, um, are you ready to dive in? I will just throw the questions out at you and then we'll go from there. Right. Sounds great. I am ready for some questions. <laughs> ready for some questions. All right. Uh, okay. Um, so first question is, uh, I know African greys are at high risk for cardiovascular disease, but is there any information on other African species such as Cape parrots, Senegals, et cetera? Also, why is the African gray in particular at a higher risk? And would a bird with a crooked neck have a higher risk? Okay, yeah. Um, so starting off with the sort of beginning of the question of, do we have information on other African species? Um, so, the the there have been studies that have been done and there's been sort of review studies that have looked at birds that have passed away from atherosclerosis and some of those species mentioned like i don't think there was any cape parrots that were mentioned at all in that study now the reality is is that it's probably just that no cape parrots were actually submitted in that study um cape parrots are not an extremely common pet uh, parrot out there for most owners. You know, for me, I know I probably only see maybe like two Cape parrots a year. Uh, they're just, they're just not as common as pets. So um, now as far as like Senegal's, Myers, the uh, African red bellies, those Poicephalus group, um, they're, those guys definitely have been found to have atherosclerosis, but also in um, less frequency than the African gray. Now it also probably goes back somewhat to the fact that the African gray is a much more common pet in the pet bird population than the Senegal or the Myers or the African red bellies, any of the Poicephalus. I mean, certainly I see plenty of um, Myers and Senegals, but I definitely see way more African grays as pets than those others. So part of the, the fact that we see African grays being so commonly found to have this disease might partially have to do with how much more common they are in the pet population. Now, you can also look at some other real common species, for example, like the blue and gold macaw. The blue and gold macaw is probably the most common macaw that people will see in uh, veterinary hospitals. And we certainly see a lot of them. Like today, I had two this morning. Um, and But we don't see as much atherosclerosis in them. So there definitely is species differences. Um, the African gray, the Amazon, the cockatiel, those three groups of birds in that particular study where they did a retrospective study looking back at birds that had passed away from atherosclerosis, those three birds topped the list. African grays, various species of Amazons, and then the cockatiel. Um, so certainly there probably has something to do with the fact that those species maybe have a little bit different metabolism or greater propensity for atherosclerosis, but we haven't figured out why that is yet. Part of it might be, yes, that those species are just really common there in the pet trade more, um, but also part of it is there probably is something that we just don't totally understand just yet. So sort of that last, the end of the question there of the um, why is it that the African gray is so commonly found? I don't have an answer for you yet. Um, that would be great if, we're, if I had an answer, but I just don't have that answer yet. And I'm sure that's something that with time and more research, we will be able to 
have that answer. You know, there's probably something different about their metabolism, how they metabolize fats. Um, maybe, you know, how their inflammatory process may be different. We don't know yet. There's still a lot of questions that we as veterinarians have. And there's lots of people um, who, you know, are starting to work more on this as research projects. And so I don't know the answer now, but maybe, you know, a couple of years from now, we'll, we'll have that answer. Um, and then the other part of the question about a bird having a, a crooked neck, um, no, that shouldn't be any reason for a bird to be more prone to atherosclerosis. Um, I'm, I don't know quite where that question comes from, um, but I will say that was not something in the studies, that retrospective study that looked at the birds that had passed away from atherosclerosis and looking at risk factors. That certainly was not a risk factor that was identified. Okay. Okay. And just a curious, um, how often do you see birds with crooked necks? I know it's not related to arthritis, but... Yeah, okay, so when I do see a crooked neck, it's usually something that's congenital. And I'll say I definitely see it more than my pet chickens, than pet parrots. Um, but I mean, I do have a couple of patients, I don't know, pr probably it's something maybe I only see like a new patient with it as far as a parrot goes once a year, every other year. Thankfully, I'm not really seeing that as a common problem. Chickens are a little bit of a different story. Chickens are um, much more commonly seen with some genetic uh, abnormalities. Um, and that's probably also because of the way that we breed them a little differently. With chickens, you know, it's one, well, for the most part, one breed. There's a couple of breeds, or excuse me, uh, species, one species for the most part. And then there's multiple breeds, right? So chickens are kind of more along the lines of like dogs, where it's just one species, but there's tons of different breeds and like different breeds have propensities for different problems. Um, that's kind of more along the lines of chickens. But parrots are different. Parrots, we don't have different breeds of parrots. We have different species of parrots. Um, so there's some differences there. Okay, that was fascinating. Um, okay, number two question for you. In your practice, would you say that heart disease is a primary cause of mortality? Yeah, so to answer that question, it sounds like the, the question is, is, will we see a bird that comes in and the main reason that it dies is from cardiac disease? And the answer is yes. I mean, we, we do absolutely have birds that come into the hospital that their primary problem, the main reason that they are there is because of cardiovascular disease. Absolutely, we for sure see it as a primary cause of a bird being ill or passing away. Now, is it the most common reason that I have a bird pass away in the hospital? No, um, there's other diseases that, or disease processes that happen that we see a little bit more commonly as primary or um, as a more frequent causes of mortality. Um, but yes, we do see cardiovascular disease as a primary problem and causing mortality. <laughs> okay. So that and, makes sense. Sorry. Um, so what are the, uh, here's another, the, another question. Uh, what are the precursors of heart disease? And also um, what are the first notable signs of the disease? Okay, so the precursors for uh, cardiovascular disease, uh, particularly atherosclerosis, again, since that's our, our main topic really is atherosclerosis here, and our main problem that we see in parrots. That study that I mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, uh, where they did a retrospective looking back at birds that were um, coming down with cardiovascular disease, they tried to look for risks associated with cardiovascular disease. Um, and one of the things we already mentioned is the, the species. So um, the African gray, the Amazon, the cockatiel, those guys sort of top the list when it comes to being having a propensity for atherosclerosis. Um, the next is uh, female sex. So females are a little bit more prone to atherosclerosis development than the males are. Um, increasing age is another thing. So as birds get older, there's a higher chance of them to have atherosclerosis. Not that it's necessarily a um, definitive thing. Like you certainly can have atherosclerosis in a young individual, but by and far, it's more common in elderly individuals. Um, so birds that are like in their 20s to 30s, you know, like our Amazons or African greys again, in their 20s to 30s, we're more likely to be picking up at that point in their life than say when they're like five years of age, eight years old, something like that, you know? Um, so species, age, sex, um, 
oh, high fats uh, in circulation. So when these birds have had been able to have blood work done on them before they've passed away, there have been many who have had high cholesterol and high triglyceride levels. So those are fats that are in circulation. Now, um, as we had talked about in the first webinar, we don't know exactly how they play a role. We do know that there are fat deposits within the um, vessels of the, the, well, the great vessels of the heart um, and other vessels, and that's what atherosclerosis plaques are. Uh, they have a component of fat within them, but we don't know exactly exactly the link between high fats and circulation and then getting out in, like inside of the um, wall of the vessel. So there's definitely more to learn. We can say that it's a link, there's an association, but not necessarily a cause. Like when you have a high cholesterol, high triglycerides in your blood, it doesn't cause atherosclerosis, at least that we can say yet. Maybe one day we'll be able to say that, but right now we can only say there's a link. Um, other things, high fat diet, so which kind of goes along with high cholesterol and high triglycerides. If you have a high fat diet, there definitely is a propensity um, for birds to have atherosclerosis. When they did that retrospective study, they looked at birds' diets and they found that higher fat diet was a common thing amongst birds that had it. Now, I definitely have known birds who have been on a good diet for a period of time and, and have atherosclerosis. A lot of those birds have had a history at some point in their life of not having so good of a diet. So, you know, um, we still have a lot to learn there of exactly the dietary links, but there is some link there. Now, the other thing is lack of exercise. So, you know, in the wild, we know that birds are flying around and expending tons of energy. And so they can eat higher fat things in the wild because, hey, they need all that extra energy to be flying all over the place. Uh, as we talked about in the original lecture, there is really a, a huge demand for energy when you're flying. And so having high fat when you're a flying bird that's flying across a you know, jungle, a forest, well, you need that. But in captivity, if you're not flying, um, or your wings are clipped, um, you're flightless for any reason, well, you're not expending as much energy as you are when you're actively flying. So that lack of exercise is also considered to be a risk factor in the development of atherosclerosis. And then one other thing that's been um, postulated as a, a risk factor is just inflammation. Um, when we look at these lesions within the vessels, there definitely are inflammatory changes in there. And so um, different in different disorders that cause inflammation have also been suspected to play somewhat of a role, but even there, we're still wondering exactly what that role is. So um, there's, there's lots of questions that we still have that we need to figure out, but again, risk factors are species, age, sex, um, high fat in the diet, uh, lack of exercise, inflammation, and then high fats in circulation. Those are the big ones that we, we know about. Um, what was the other part of the question? I lost it. <laughs> oh, uh, no. Uh, oh, the first notable notable signs. Oh, first uh, notable signs. Thank you. Um, so as far as the, the signs that we can see, uh, it's also somewhat variable. So that's a little bit of a hard question to answer um, because there's so much variety. I will say probably the first thing is lethargy. So a bird just being quieter uh, because again, with atherosclerosis, it's fat that's developing and plaques that are developing inflammatory deposits that are developing within the walls of a vessel. And so we take this big vessel that's nice and big and open and we shrink it down in size, which means we're not getting as good of blood flow around the body and we're not getting as good of blood delivery to tissues, which means we're not getting oxygen and nutrients to tissues and wastes away from tissues as effectively. And if you're not getting enough oxygen to tissues, you know, you need oxygen to have normal cellular metabolism. You need to get nutrition to your cells to have normal cellular functions. And if you're not getting that as adequately as you're supposed to, well, then you can just feel kind of weak and crummy and lethargic and just sort of blah. So, it's a very non-specific sign because the reality is a lot of diseases cause animals to just feel crummy and lethargic and not want to do normal activities. So when you see a bird that is acting lethargic, you can't say, oh gosh, it's, it's atherosclerosis. That's the only thing it could be. 
no, it's just um, one of the signs that you can see associated with it. Uh, and that's probably the first sign. But then other signs that you can see, um, you can see neurologic signs. Uh, another study was done that showed that birds that had atherosclerosis were eight times more likely to have neurologic problems than birds that did not have atherosclerosis. Uh, so we do know that neurologic problems can be associated with it. things like seizure activity or what's called ataxia, which is kind of like walking around like you're, you're drunk, um, not really having good fine motor movements uh, can be seen. And then um, other things is respiratory distress. Now, respiratory distress, I will say, tends to happen in the later stages, like if they are in congestive heart failure, secondary to um, atherosclerosis, because you can get a buildup of fluid um, in different parts of the body, uh, and that can then lead to some respiratory-like signs where they may be having tail bobbing or they may be open mouth breathing, that sort of stuff. But I won't say that's a, the most common I would that's kind of more end end stage it's unfortunately something that the signs can even sometimes not really be there um you can have a bird that seems to be totally fine and sadly found dead one morning on the bottom of a cage and a necropsy is done and atherosclerotic lesions are found um you know so it is something that can sadly show no signs even sometimes. Okay, okay. Uh, it kind of touches upon our next question uh, a little bit about um, if a bird is slightly obese due to age and not eager to fly a lot, is it prone to having um, heart disease? So you got oh, an active um, bird that's... Yeah, so if a bird's obese, um, you know, yes, that kind of goes back to that dietary link, right, where they probably have been on a high fat diet for a period of time and also back to the exercise link of they probably haven't been exercising much right we know that um, in many, many animals, if you have high caloric intake and not of and a lot of energy expenditure, you're going to store all that extra caloric intake, you're going to convert it into fat, um, and obesity happens. And so yes, birds that are um, obese are a little bit higher likelihood to be at risk for um, atherosclerosis specifically. Um, and, and just to make a point, um, again, we're mostly talking about atherosclerosis here, but there are other cardiovascular problems too. Um, so it's those other cardiovascular problems that can be present, some of these risk factors aren't necessarily gonna apply. This is for atherosclerosis specifically, so. Okay. All right, ready for the next one? Um, yes. So this one is how long after flight should the heart rate and rapid breathing return to normal in a healthy bird? Okay, so in a healthy bird, it actually should be relatively relatively soon. Now, it will also be based on what their um, normal exercise regimen is. Uh, just like in people, if you work out, if you're a runner, you know, you're going to recover from exercising a lot quicker than somebody who doesn't do a lot of ex exercise. Now, both individuals may be healthy and be considered by a doctor to be, you know, totally healthy human specimens. But if you are not used to exercising um, and you have to suddenly go run a mile, you're probably going to be panting a little bit at the end and take a little bit longer period to recuperate than somebody who runs every day. Running a mile for a person who does marathons all the time, they're going to have no problem. They're going to recover really quickly. So keep that in mind that a healthy bird, there is going to be some variability in their recovery rate. But a healthy bird, even if it hasn't done a lot of flight um, and say it just flew around because it got spooked by something um, and then it landed and you'll see it maybe have a little bit of a, a heavy breathing just for a moment. It, it really honestly should only be for, you know, just a moment, like maybe a minute or two and it should be back to relaxing. I will say that in exam rooms, for example, when I have to examine a bird um, and I wrap it up in a towel, sometimes they get a little nervous while they're in a towel and they may even do start to do a little panting um, and when we set them down I always tell owners okay he's just a little nervous he's going to relax let's give him just a couple of minutes and usually within a couple of minutes um, they're going to return to return to normal 
um, heart rate and, and respiratory rate. Now, if you have a bird that has cardiovascular problems, it can take a lot longer. And so that is something to, to keep in mind if your bird was once a very um, uh, active individual um, and they used to fly around great and they weren't winded and then they start to have periods where they're becoming winded. Well, something is going on. Doesn't mean it's cardiovascular disease necessarily, but it's just an indication something's a, a problem and, and evaluation um, by a veterinarian is recommended. Okay. Okay. Um, so now this, this actually, I like how these questions kind of piggyback on one another at the, with more in-depth question here is um, part for part two. What are the main? Okay, there's a there's a few questions in this this paragraph here. So first is what are the main things people can do to ensure optimal life um, uh, lifelong best heart health? And then um, there's certain a lot. Uh, sure, a lot of it has to do with exercise and food. So how should we be inspiring exercise in our birds? And um, let's see. This person has a bird that flies, but obviously nowhere like a wild bird would fly. Um, only commuting here and there uh, during, you know, short little bits of flight. Um, and along the, along the food side is the daily recommendation of fat content still at no more than a teaspoon in a portion daily for parrots? Okay, yeah, there's a few, a few questions yeah. in there. Huh? We're talking about, you know, short flights, not long flights. We're talking about portion sizes and all that good yeah. stuff. Um, okay, so the start of that too is optimal heart health, like what can yes. we do for your optimal heart health? All right. So um, again, we can go back to the risk factors that were identified in that one study that showed, okay, here's the risks that we come up with that say this, these are the things that are likely going to, or are, are associated with atherosclerosis. So, you know, again, cause, we haven't totally been able to say that yet, but we can at least start looking at those risk factors and say, well, maybe we need to do the opposite of those particular things. Now, there's certain things that we can't change. So like we said, uh, some of the risk factors being species, uh, sex, age, we can't change those particular things, right? Like you're always going to be an African gray if you're an African gray. A royal is always going to be an Amazon. It's never going to turn into a macaw, right? So I can't change that. <laughs> um, and we can't change if you're male or female. That's just, that's just the way it is. Um, and of course, Every day we live, we get a day older. So, you know, um, we're always aging. So I can't change those particular things. But the other things that were in the um, uh, risk factors of high fat diet, high cholesterol and triglycerides in blood, um, lack of exercise, those sort of things, inflammation, all those things, we can adjust those things slightly, right? So if we're looking for optimal cardiac health, we probably in our captive population, um, our pet birds, we want them to probably be eating a lower fat diet. Again, if high fat diets were associated with atherosclerosis, low fat diet is probably going to be a good thing for them in captivity. Again, going back to the fact that they do not expend as much energy in captivity um, as they do in the wild. So low fat in captivity, probably the way to go as one of your main things to be good for cardiac health in the long run. Um, next thing is ex exercise. If we can allow our birds to be flighted, that's great. Now, again, it's not for everybody. Not everybody can keep their pet bird flighted. There are risks associated with being flighted as well. And I think we've talked about it in some webinars in the past. Um, but if you have the ability to keep your bird flighted, if you do Oh, bless you. <laughs> um, if you have the ability to allow them to have that exercise um, in your home, great. Encourage it. Allow them to fly around your home or have an aviary in your yard or whatever, something that allows them to be able to fly around. Or, I mean, I know there's people who do free flying with birds too. Of course, you got to be uh, knowing what you're doing. That is not something that's recommended unless you are really uh, knowing what you're doing and knowing how to recall and uh, have your birds trained, all that sort of stuff. But if that's something that you can do and you can dedicate your time to and get your birds to be in free, free flight groups, okay, you know. Um, uh, but there's a right way to do it, you know, a safe way with, with all these things. Um, people will sometimes have their birds harnessed, you know, and they can take them out and be a little safer with them being flighted. But um, if you can't have your bird flighted, I, for example, currently, and Arroyo just tried to show us his wings, he's not flighted, he's currently clipped. So how am I going to get him exercise because I'm not having him fly around my house? Um, you know, I can encourage exercise by having him 
do stuff on his little tree stand here. He's got lots of toys and different things to engage his activities. And so he's constantly walking around and doing different things on his tree stand, um, allowing him to walk around on the floor. Now there's some species that are a little bit more excited about walking on the floor than others. Like, I mean, African greys are ground foragers. So they do tend to like walk around a little bit more, but like Arroyo really doesn't like to walk around on the floor much. He's a bit more of a, likes to be up on things. So I have to engage him um, with stuff up on surfaces more and getting him to play around on surfaces as opposed to like having to walk across uh, a, a room, you know, versus my African greys, both my greys will walk around for a while, you know, on the floor so they can get their exercise that way. Um, so uh, trick training with them to like encourage them to do different behaviors and have fun and be playful um, to get their exercise that way is a good thing. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to mention too. So uh, diet, exercise, but then we also talked about uh, in inflammatory conditions being something that could be a contributing factor to atherosclerosis. Um, and so making sure that birds aren't, you know, they're staying healthy and not having infectious diseases and things like that um, is important. Testing them for infectious diseases, make sure they're not carriers of infectious diseases because certain infectious diseases can cause chronic inflammatory changes. And so, you know, having them stay healthy in those ways is important. Uh, and then another thing that <laughs> has been found to be helpful, um, at least we think, we still need more research, but there have been some studies that looked at um, omega-3 uh, fatty acid content within birds. Um, and there was a study that looked at the omega-3 fatty acid content in muscles of birds after they had passed away. And they compared those individuals that had atherosclerosis to those individuals that did not have any atherosclerosis lesions. And the birds that did not have any atherosclerosis lesions had higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids um, in their musculature than those birds that had um, atherosclerosis. So there's some thoughts that if you have higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids in your body, that is a cardioprotective thing. There's also studies that have shown when you have uh, give birds fish oil, which is a great source of omega-3 fatty acids, um, to cockatiels. The study was actually done specifically in cockatiels. It lowers certain fat levels in their blood. So omega-3 fatty acids may be something that we can give to our birds that can help them um, have lower propensity for atherosclerosis. And omega-3 fatty acids are usually going to be things like fish oil, flax oil, um, you know, same things that, you know, our human doctors tell us to take um, for cardiac health. They may also be very helpful for our birds too. Um, so that's something that probably as time goes on and we get more research, we'll have more um, ability to say if that is a, a good preventative, um, but it is something that you, people can do as, as at least some help at home. Um, yeah. So, okay, now that was part the first, essentially the first part of the question. Um, second part of the question. Oh, there was the question about the fats, how much fat is recommended in the diet? Um, yeah, they wanted to know if there was uh, more than a teaspoon in, in, in portion daily for parrots, if that's a uh... No more than a, than a teaspoon. Okay, so I will say that is a that's hard for me to give a broad uh, statement like that um, because we have to remember that when we're talking about parrots, we're talking from about anything from down to your little budgie or parrotlet that's like you know twenty four grams up to your highest synth macaw that's you know over a kilogram, right? So um, there's a lot of variability of size in between uh, there. So um, you know, saying one teaspoon per parrot isn't going to work, right? Because that budgie, one teaspoon of fat a day, you're going to have a problem with that budgie. But one teaspoon of fat a day for that high and macaw, maybe not enough, you know? So there is, it really depends on what particular species we're talking about. Um, and so I, what I would recommend, rather than thinking about so much of the fat, one thing to, that's easier to look at is sort of the caloric intake. Um, on a lot of foods that are out there, we can easily identify how many calories are in like a pelleted diet or in you know a particular food item that you're feeding. Um, and those calories are related to fat. I mean, the higher the fat level is, the higher the calories are in the diet. And we can do calculations with parrots 
to determine what their daily caloric is, need is. Just like with people, you know, you can do calculations to find out how much calories do I need based off of my age, my activity level, that sort of stuff. We can do those exact same things in parrots. Um, yes, there's less research behind parrots with it, but we do at least have some knowledge. Um, and I know we've talked about it in previous webinars as well. I, I think I even uh, gave a um, list in one of the webinars, I think in one of the nutrition webinars, actually, of like what the average caloric intake is and need is for an African gray versus a cockatiel versus a macaw, what have you. Um, and so you can look at that. You can go to your veterinarian, have your veterinarian calculate the caloric needs for your individual bird, because it's also going to be based off of not only their species, again, but their age, their activity level, and what their current body condition is. Are they overweight? Are they underweight? Go to your vet, have them examine your bird, figure out what is the caloric need is for that individual. And then that's when you go back and look at the diet and go, okay, here's what the actual diet is. And now I can calculate what I need to actually give to this individual on a daily basis. So um, it's, it's easier to think of it in those terms as opposed to like, okay, a budgie gets X amount of fat, uh, Amazon gets X amount of fat. So, and I will also say, the amount of fat that a bird actually needs, based on our current studies that we have, um, it, it's mostly kind of based off of chicken work that we have. Um, so, you know, chickens are running around on the ground, they're not flying in the air. Uh, so there's, there's a lot that we don't know. So looking at it more from a caloric intake is a little bit easier to manage and uh, deal with. So that was another part of the question. And then yes. there was one more part to that question. Um, let's see. You answered that inspiring exercises. Yes, you got that one. Um, let's see. I think you, I mean, the ensuring the optimal long life for the best health, I think you covered that. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think you, I think you hit all the, the spots there. Okay. Or where, where's the royal? <laughs> royal is kind of yeah, he's down here now. <laughs> he's playing on the you know, I I think um when when he when he started saying his name, he like he kind of it, it seemed like he started to really respond to that, and then and then he was just like, hey, I'm just gonna have fun here. <laughs> so, yeah. You're a better play gym than than the play right. gym. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, he's showing us that, that that that's right. Royal is giving us an example of of how much exercise a bird can get while on a on a place, uh, play gym or stand or play tree, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and is that, I'm sorry, just, I'm curious, is that an apple um, in his little dish back? What, oh, what is it's actually a lemon. Um, it's a lemon, okay. <laughs> and it was on the countertop and he stole it yesterday. Um, and so we we're like, oh, he can have it. And, you know, he's just been picking at it and playing with it. And he's, I don't know that he's eating too much of it. He's really mostly just having fun, like tearing it apart. <laughs> Okay. I was like, is it a, a Kong toy or is it an app? Okay. Mystery solved. Thank you. All right. <laughs> okay. So our next question is, um, oh, this is interesting. So they've heard that animal protein, including eggs, is a leading cause of atherosclerosis in birds. Any research to support that? So one, is that true? Is there research to support that? Okay. That is a good question. And um, the short answer is there is not research in parrots to support that. Now, um, there is actually some studies in chickens, um, and that there was a study that was done um, where they had given birds um, uh, egg in the diet, and they compared it to three things. Actually, I wrote it down. Here. Um, so they had given them either powdered egg, they gave them fresh egg, and they gave them um, a soy-based diet as another option that had no cholesterol in it. Um, and what they found in the study is that those birds, because they broke them up into three groups, they had the powdered egg group, they had the fresh egg group, and then they had the soy-based no cholesterol in the diet, diet. And they found that the birds that were in the powdered and the fresh egg diet, they both had higher um, levels of cholesterol in their blood. They also had higher fat in their um, uh, liver, and specifically they had higher cholesterol in the liver compared to the birds that were on the soy-based diet. And again, this isn't chickens. Um, they also found 
that in the egg group specifically, not the not the powdered egg, but the fresh egg group, um, they found in that group that they did have aortic atherosclerosis lesions more severe than in any other group of birds. Now, they then were the researchers question, well, really, what's the difference between powdered egg and fresh egg? Um, and what they thought, you know, this is something that further research would really need to be done to determine if this is the case. But what they thought is that the powdered egg gets this, um, thing, the powdered egg ends up getting oxidized cholesterol in it. And that oxidized form of cholesterol may actually lead to this sort of feedback inhibition within the, within the body that um, stops further cholesterol synthesis within the liver. Um, but that oxidized cholesterol is not present in the fresh egg. And so that um, normal pathway for synthesis of cholesterol within the liver isn't inhibited. And so the birds, not only do they get the cholesterol from the egg, but then they just keep making cholesterol um, on their own in their body. And so those increased levels of cholesterol, again, may be a contributing factor to the development of atherosclerosis. So we do have that information. We have that study in chickens to say that we know that chickens, if given fresh egg, can have worse atherosclerosis lesions than those that don't get it. Does that translate over to parrots? We don't know because a study hasn't been done in parrots. And, you know, parrots are a little different. They're physiology than chickens. Um, but we have to go back to the reality is that when it comes to a lot of research on nutrition and stuff in birds, most of it is done in the chicken and the chicken is sort of our model. And the chicken is the model for a lot of other health things in birds too. And, and there's, there's good and bad things about it. I mean, you know, a lot of things probably do apply, but probably everything doesn't apply. So we have to, we have to keep in mind the limitations of you know, maybe the the um, there there is evidence in birds to say maybe we shouldn't be putting giving them fresh eggs, but we also don't have definitive concrete evidence. So you just got to be mindful of that to not be too uh, I guess sort of passionate about uh, your opinion on eggs in birds. Um, but keep it in mind that maybe it isn't the, the best thing to be offering them, at least with the information we have right now for, for chickens, we know that it's not. So maybe for parrots, it isn't the best thing for them to be getting fresh egg in the diet either. Um, so that that is what we do know. So take that as you will. We do need more research. <laughs> okay. Especially with Easter coming up, you know, all those eggs there. We, it just, so, when they, so I was curious, when they say fresh egg, is that I mean, is that scrambled raw? Do you? Oh, um, you know, I think it was just raw. I honestly would have to go back and look in, in, at the paper. The powdered is basically like it's like um, dehydrated and then powdered. So, so it's a processed essentially. You yeah. know, um, so it is a little different. So that being said, you know, if the powdered egg is okay. Um, if that is somehow incorporated in our birds' diets in other ways, like if it's part of um, the makeup of like some sort of treat or pellet or something like that, then that might actually be okay. However, again, they did show at least that there was higher levels of cholesterol within the blood and within the liver of birds that did get the powdered egg as well, but they didn't have as much atherosclerotic lesions. So um, okay. there's still okay. some questions there. <laughs> that yeah, I know that. The, the tendency for, for, for pet bird stewards is to make me give a little scrambled eggs. I was just curious if it, you know, like the raw it's, versus a fresh versus all that. Yeah, I, I think it was raw, but you know, now that you're asking me that question <laughs> specifically, I need to go back and read that paper again to reconfirm if that is the case. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, let's see. Oh, okay. So this next question, uh, we might have a screen share. Is that, is that right? Oh, um, which is what? So is this it? one is, uh, do you have a picture of a bird uh, with congestive or cardiac heart failure, uh, fluid buildup in the abdomen? I do. And actually it is a picture from um, the previous webinar, but I am gonna go ahead, let me screen share really quick here and then I will pull it up for you guys. And okay, so this just is one of the slides from the, the previous webinar. Um, and just to show you guys, 
what it is we're looking at with a bird that has congestive heart failure. And this bird, this bird did pass away. Um, she did have atherosclerosis that we did identify after she had passed away. We were suspicious that it was atherosclerosis that was her problem, um, but it wasn't confirmed until after she passed away. And she did have congestive heart failure secondary to atherosclerosis. And what we're seeing in this image, her heart is up here, but I can't see the margins of her heart as easily as I should. And then this is the down here, sort of this shape here is the edges of her liver, but I also can't see her liver as well as I should. I'm gonna go up one slide here on this one. I want you to pay attention to this half of the bird. It's like the, what looks what's on the left side of the screen is the right side of the bird. Um, what you'll notice is this is the edge of the heart here and then the edge of the liver. And we have what's called an hourglass sort of shape, an hourglass silhouette um, between the heart and the liver. And you can see there's lung up here, there's air sac over here. Um, the left or the uh, left side of the bird is a little uh, abnormal. So we're gonna ignore that side, but this is a little bit more normal on this side here. Now we're gonna go back to our bird over here and comparatively, you can see that I don't really have that normal hourglass sort of shape um, to that cardiohepatic silhouette. It looks really wide and abnormal. The other thing that we're seeing on this bird is the back part of the abdomen here. She does have an old collapsed egg that was an incidental finding. Um, so try to ignore that in the picture for a moment. But in the back part of the abdomen, I don't have a good ability to see a lot of detail. And the reason I don't have a good ability to see a lot of detail of intestines like I normally would is because there's fluid around those intestines. When you get congestive heart failure, you get a backup of fluid and that fluid can kind of leak out into different body cavities depending upon what type of congestive heart failure you get. But in birds, they typically get right-sided congestive heart failure, and that usually leads to backup of fluid sort of into, well, the liver gets sort of bigger and congested, and then they can get a sort of leakage of fluid um, around the intestines as well. And it makes it so that you have this poor ability to see the intestines on an x-ray image. And then if we look at her other image here, because this is what's called the uh, VD view, it's a ventrodorsal view, she's laying on her back for this image. And then this is the lateral view, which is the image that she's laying on her side. Her heart is up here, her liver is down here. I should normally have some black air sac space over here. And I'm not having that normal black air sac space like I would like to see. Instead of having all this sort of graying. And what that graying is, is it's fluid um, that's, building up from that congestive heart failure, um, kind of making its way around the organs within the uh, back part of the body there. Um, so it just, when we get congestive heart failure, you have a very poor ability to see normal organs like you should on an x-ray. So, all right, I'm gonna stop sharing because that was the picture for you guys. <laughs> okay, all right, how's it? Uh... That's on the, uh, that's also, that's a slide from the previous webinar. So there you go. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, next question is, uh, someone wants, someone wants to know if Pionis um, is included in the Amazon data on, you know, the st stats that you have for the Amazon data. Oh, so um, from that original, that sort of at the beginning of the uh, webinar, when I was talking about that study, that was that retrospective study that was looking at all these different birds that had atherosclerosis and what species were they? Yeah. I mean, we, we do have lots of other species that were included in that data as well um but just they did not make up like the more common species so like again the pionis the senegals the myers they were like really really not commonly seen in that particular study now it's interesting though because then you go well pionis and amazons like you know they're kind of a similar uh group of birds so why is it that the amazon is more commonly seen, but not the pionis. Um, and you know that with that question, that makes me sit here and think about it um, personally. I don't think I've had a pionis patient that has had atherosclerosis. I know they're out there, and they, it's again it was in that particular study that it has been seen. But um, you know, it's uh, I, I can't think of a pionis that I've had that has had that has had atherosclerosis as a problem. So there probably is something that's different that we just don't know about them yet. You know. 
Okay. Yeah. The next question is also uh, kind of a species specific. Um, what data is available for uh, columba forms? Did I say that right? Columbus. What are what? Yeah. So okay, that's a good and, question. And who's included in that group? Let's look. Okay. Enlighten. So the columba forms are like our pigeons and our doves. Those are those guys. Um, and and if there is another bird that has a lot of studies in it aside from the chicken, it's the pigeon. Um, so we do actually have some data on them too, which is, is helpful. Um, and actually in the pigeons, there are certain species that are, or not species, I'm sorry, uh, breeds, certain breeds, because again, the just like I was talking about with the chickens, how there's breeds, but not many species, you know, um, the pigeons, we're talking about um, the, like the rock pigeon, um, you know, that people have bred to have a variety of different breeds within them. There's the um, white carno and the uh, sh um, uh, show racer pigeon. Those guys actually have a genetic predisposition to developing atherosclerosis. So um, there's probably something that happened in the, the breeding process uh, that maybe we selected for genetically that we you know, was an unintended thing to select for. Uh, that is something that happens when, when we're doing artificial selection with breeding animals. Um, sometimes we may be selecting for one particular trait that we really like, um, and other traits may come along with it that are less desirable. Um, so we do know that there are those two breeds of chickens, or not chickens, oh my gosh, pigeons, <laughs> that are more prone to atherosclerosis than some others. Um, and there have been some studies in them where they've actually used those particular breeds as models um, for atherosclerosis. Um, and so, you know, that may be something that who knows, they might be even used even more in the future with other uh, studies in atherosclerosis to help us understand it better in parrots. Um, so, you know, time will tell. We'll probably have more research on them as well, but we, we, do, we do have some studies in them. Um, showing that yes, they get it too. And there are some that are genetically predisposed. Okay. And I imagine there's a difference if you have the city pigeons, you know, they're eating like discards of McDonald French fries and stuff. They might. <laughs> yeah. It, it, their diet might be a little, they're scavenging. I, I remember um, one time uh, a seagull um, that I had to do a necropsy on. The seagull had passed away and we had done a necropsy to determine why she had passed away. And uh, she had atherosclerotic lesions and she was a wild seagull, you know, but I mean, you think about seagulls, like they uh, will definitely eat your French fries and whatever you have when you're, you know, on the beach, having a good time, they are not uh, afraid to take things. And there's all those like YouTube videos too of, of seagulls, like walking into convenience stores and stealing like bags of chips and stuff, you know, so yeah. <laughs> like you can kind of see how that could happen. <laughs> they were definitely bold, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we have a question. Uh, someone's male, uh, a male uh, six-year-old conure has a belly between its legs. Um, his blood work comes back as normal every year. So how would they know if this is caused by like, uh, they say a leaky heart condition? Uh, yeah, the, you know. well, so um, when we have a bird that has a distended abdomen, normally a bird, that's one of the things that I'm looking for on a physical exam. My normal physical exam is I feel their abdomen and their abdomen should feel concave and very like the skin over that abdomen should be like really tight. Um, and sometimes that abdomen is distended. And, and if I have a distended abdomen, I need to figure out why, because that's not normal in a bird. And one of the things could be fluid um, that is developing. And one of the reasons you can get fluid developing is because of cardiovascular disease. Now, if the bird has had this for a long time, it's probably not cardiovascular disease. It's probably something else because by the time a bird goes into congestive heart failure from cardiovascular disease, they are very far along in their disease process. And actually, um, in one of the more recent veterinary texts, they looked at birds going into congestive heart failure and how long they had of a period of time from the time they diagnosed congestive heart failure to the time that the bird passed away. And it was about 30 days. So it was rather quick. Um, and you don't develop fluid from cardiac disease until you develop congestive heart failure. So if that period of time is only a month, 
um, average, you know, there's birds that may be less than that. There may be birds that uh, way go beyond that. Uh, but the average was 30 days. If this bird has been having this for over a year, probably not congestive heart failure that's causing it. Probably one of the other causes for fluid, if it is fluid, it could be fat, it could be an uh, organ that's enlarged. And although blood work may look normal, that's going to help rule out certain things. Things like x-rays might need to be done or um, a CT scan, you know, some sort of imaging to identify an ultrasound, you know, a variety of things to could be done further to really identify why does this bird have a big belly? But my guess is it's probably not congestive heart failure in that individual. Okay. Um, and our next question, I think we've touched upon it a couple of times already, but uh, if you don't have a bird that, that uh, can fly, what physical activity do you suggest? You, you mentioned the play, the play tree, the play yeah, gym. The play trees, um, if, if you can get them to walk around, if they're an individual who will walk, climb, that sort of stuff, encouraging that. Um, and then also just back to the trick training too, because if you can trick train them to do different things, you can cue them to like move around a lot more. Um, even just if you can... Uh, target train them to touch a target you can move them to different places to get them to get their exercise targeting them around so that's something that you could try I remember someone uh, back in my bird talk days they, they suggested that you uh, the ladder you, you have them go up the ladder and then reverse the ladder and then they're back at the bottom of the ladder and they go up the ladder and reverse the reverse it back and then climbing back up it as little yeah. You can create like exercise stations for them and that could be kind of like if you're at the gym yourself and you're doing like you know all the all the stations that you could do that um all right and then let's see oh walnuts walnuts are healthy for humans is that the case for parrots due to the high omega-3 content yeah i mean you know walnuts do have some high omega-3s in there so definitely that is as we talked about earlier omega-3 fatty acids in the diet having those at higher levels may be something that's cardioprotective for birds and, and and in the future we could be saying hey we need more of that um, in their diet so yes but with the caveat being that there's also calories associated with those walnuts so don't overdo it <laughs> okay. they can have it but in proportion just like just like everything else you know when it comes to diets you know you can sometimes have some of the stuff that's a little higher calorie and a little higher fat but keep in mind the entire diet how much of it you're actually offering um, to balance it out right and, and what species can actually crack open their own walnut <laughs> Well, the macaws, right? But like he yeah. can't open a walnut. <laughs> no. Would you say macaws are like the only ones who can actually just. Yeah, and cockatoos, you know, the bigger cockatoos, not the little guys. <laughs> All right. So you need a nutcracker otherwise, or, or buy them already out of shop. Okay. Yes. <laughs> um, okay. Any particular fat to stay away from? There's saturated, sat, um, saturated, or polyunsaturated, or just all fats. So are we distinguishing between the types of fats? Yeah, so you do need to distinguish between the types of fats. It is true because there's lots of different types of fats and, you know, there are good fats, right? Um, so yes, you probably want to stay away from your saturated fats, um, just like in people. Um, cholesterol, so that kind of brings us back to that egg thing, you know, of is the egg appropriate in the diet or not? Um, again, they showed in the chickens that it's going to lead to higher cholesterol levels. Now, um, naturally in like a, a parrot diet, um, a, a parrot, parrots are really much more um, uh, on the herbivore side and, and uh, they really aren't eating um, any sort of like uh, animal-based products naturally in the wild. Again, maybe they get like an, a bug here or there during breeding season for most of our parrots, um, but they're not getting a ton of that and it's, and it's during select times of year. And where does cholesterol come from? Cholesterol comes from animal products. Cholesterol isn't in, in plant products. Um, so they probably shouldn't have a lot of cholesterol in their diet. Um, again, we need more research to truly say that, but that is probably the case. So. Okay. And then I, I so just, uh, you mentioned, uh, omega three fatty acids. Um, which ones do you, what are the ones you suggest, uh, to get that source? So, I mean, the big ones that are out there are the, you know, fish oil, flax oil. There's also, you know, the, um, krill and I think people even make some from the walnut um so there are many sources but the two big easy to find ones at most like grocery stores are going to be your fish oil and your flax seed oil um and again we still need more research to really say which one is going to be the best one to give but there is research in cockatiels that compared uh fish oil and flaxseed oil and they found that 
the birds that were getting the fish oil, that is what lowered their fat levels in blood. The birds that got the flaxseed oil, it didn't lower their fat levels in blood. Now, that doesn't mean that the flaxseed isn't good. It just means that if your bird specifically has high fat levels, you might wanna be doing the fish oil with them to help get those fat levels down in circulation. But if you have a bird that doesn't have high fat levels and is more like baseline healthy and we're just wanting to add in some omega-3 fatty acids because we had that study that showed that birds had, had higher levels of omega-3 fatty acids and their muscles had less incidence of atherosclerosis, then flaxseed oil may be totally fine for those individuals. So, I mean, uh, just, I will say personally with my birds, I do, I, I put fish oil on their food on a daily basis. It's just something that I do uh, because of those studies and I want to do some sort of prevention, you know? Um, so I, I use the fish oil personally because I know the study in cockatiels was done, um, but we still need more studies to truly say like, you may be totally fine doing the flaxseed oil, get the same sort of benefit if it's before they actually have any high fat levels. So how, how do you administer the, the fish oil? Like, so I get capsules of fish oil. And if you are going to do fish oil for birds, you don't want to get it from like those big like pumps because the problem is the, the fish oil oxidizes um, rather rapidly. And so you have to really get it from the capsule because that's what keeps it fresh and stable. Um, and so I get a capsule of fish oil, I poke a hole in it and I squirt it on top of their pellets. Um, and I just like randomly squirt it on several pellets so that they probably aren't getting everything that I put on their pellets or they should be getting some of it on their pellets. Um, and then I, I mean, I do use flaxseed as well as portions of their diet too, but I use the, the fish oil on a daily basis. They just each get a little bit on top of their pellets so they know that they're getting some omega-3 fatty acids. Okay, okay. Um, and then, oh, this, Interesting question. So we might, we talked about eggs earlier. What about um, egg whites? So one might know if there's dietary issues with egg whites. Oh okay, yeah, that that is a a uh, good question. I, uh, that study when we go back to the one that was done on chickens. <laughs> use that whole fresh egg and the powdered egg. And so that's the yolk and the albumin. Um, the, the, the albumin, sorry, is the white part of the egg. Um, so now we know the cholesterol comes from the yolk. There isn't any cholesterol in the white part of the egg. Um, so probably the white part of the egg, if you have, to, if you're going to give your bird egg, it's probably better to do the white than the, than the yolk because you're not getting any cholesterol in that white part of the egg. But that study didn't like differentiate that, you know, they didn't pull it out and look at the two separately to, to see. So I can't definitively say that the white is totally safe and fine. And then there's also some thoughts too regarding, um, there was a study in, in cockatiels that found if they got a lot of protein in the diet, then they could develop what's called lipogranulomas, which are these like fatty inflammatory lesions within the liver. Um, and I mean, the white of the, the an egg is mostly albumin protein. Um, and so, you know, it's probably totally fine to do it intermittently here and there, but probably not something good to do on a daily basis. Because again, we also go back to naturally, what are these birds doing in the wild? Are they eating eggs on a daily basis in the wild? No, they may eat an egg here or there during breeding season if there was an egg of theirs that went bad, but they're not, you know, people haven't seen parrots raiding other parrots' nests and or other birds' nests and eating their eggs as part of their diet, right? So, um, you know, maybe not a great idea for us to totally give that every single day. Every once in a while, fine. Um, just like me eating a chocolate cake every once in a while, great. Uh, but not every day. <laughs> okay. And then, so we're kind of getting nearing the end here, but I, I couple, just two more questions for you. One is, um, so I want to know how, I, I want to know this too. How do you take a bird's blood pressure? Like, why is it not commonly done at routine checkups? Because like, when we go to the doctor, we, you know, they do your blood pressure every time. So, yeah. yeah. So, um, th th I mean, that's a great question. You can take a blood pressure on a bird. And so the way you take a blood pressure on a bird, they have this little vein um, right over the inner portion of the wing. And you can put that same little um, thing that you're using to I hear the heartbeat. Um, and then you can put a cuff high up above that. You put the cuff on and then you just pump the cuff up and it restricts blood flow. You don't hear any blood uh, heart sounds or whatever. And then you like loosen it up. Uh, and as you're loosening up the pressure and then blood starts to flow and that kind of tells you where uh, your pressure is. So yes, you can do it. You can also do it on the leg of a bird too. 
same thing. You put the little cuff on and you pump it up and then you slowly release the pressure and you're listening for that heartbeat. And once you hear that heartbeat, then okay, the blood pressure is wherever it is on that little meter on the um, cuff. Now, you can do it, but there's problems with it in birds. And that's why it's not done routinely. The problems with it in birds is... Um, the, there's a lot of variability. Now there's two types of blood pressure. You can take direct blood pressure or indirect blood pressure. Indirect blood pressure is where you're using those little cuffs. Direct blood pressure is if you have a catheter inside of an artery. And if you are doing direct blood pressure, you get uh, accurate results in a bird. But in order to do that, you have to have a catheter in an artery. And so that means that's something that's happening typically when a bird is under anesthesia because uh, they may struggle a bit with you trying to put a catheter in them with them awake, right? So that's something that we can do when a bird's under anesthesia. So, but it's invasive, right? So we usually want to go more with the indirect blood pressure measurement because it's not invasive. But the accuracy is not that great in birds, probably partially because we don't have the best cuffs. I mean, you can get these little teeny tiny pediatric cuffs. We have them here. We do use them. Um, but we know that when we're using them, that we're not having the greatest accuracy because studies have been done where they have looked at birds' blood pressures by indirect measurements, and they have found that there is variability from one measurement to the next in the same bird, up to like, I think the average was like 32 uh, millimeters of mercury, which for blood pressure, that is a that's pretty big change. Um, so eh, it might be something that you can use for measuring or for monitoring trends. And that's kind of how, when I use it, that's how I'm using it is I'm monitoring trends in this particular individual. I'm helping it be like, I'm using it to help me as a part of my um, investigation for this particular bird's problem. But I also have to be keeping in mind that it's not extremely accurate. So I can't read a ton into it. So that's why it's not done routinely with birds. Wow. That's fascinating. I'm trying to imagine that on a little budgie leg or something. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Good luck with that. Right. right. Um, all right, and I think this is a good question to end on for today. Uh, can you reverse atherosclerosis? Uh, sorry, I'm a little tongue tied here. Um, or is the goal to prevent it, uh, the advancement of the disease and the onset of other cardiac diseases? Yes. So, okay, the answer to the first question is can we reverse it? The answer is no. I wish we could. Maybe one day, you know, and I'm not going to say that it's impossible because there's probably something out there that could help with breaking down those plaques, but we don't have that yet. We haven't discovered it. Maybe it's out there. We don't know. Um, so hopefully one day we'll have something that can reverse it. But as of now, no, we don't have something that can reverse it. The goal is more prevention, preventing atherosclerosis, or when we do have a bird that has it, managing it and trying to uh, trying to prevent it from getting worse and trying to prevent the signs and problems that happen as a result of atherosclerosis. That's what we end up having to to deal with. So prevention is really what we want. Um, and so, you know, I getting this webinar out there to let people know about the risk factors so that we can try to maybe do the opposite things of the risk factors is hopefully a way to um, prevent it for birds. All right. I think that's a, that's a great conclusion to this wonderful presentation. Um, and we got so many people thanking you for your time today. I mean, that's super nice. I mean, this, uh, how else are we going to learn about these topics? It's, it's just, so amazing. Yeah. Um, so I want to uh, so I want to thank everyone for joining us today, and also I want to announce our winner of our giveaway. And um, let's see, who is that? That is going to be Carol. Carol Perry, um, you are today's giveaway winner. Um, I'm going to play our, our video of what you'll be winning. Um, we'll be saying the fever office will contact you to send it out to you. Um, and just a reminder, we don't have a webinar next Friday, but we will be back um, with, uh, I think it's Lisa Bono, um, the weekend after whatever, my, my calendar's off here, uh, not next Friday, but the Friday after, she'll be talking about choosing safe toys. And um, Dr. Lamb, I'm sure we'll be seeing you in May. Oh my goodness, <laughs> May's gonna, we'll be seeing you in May um, with another fascinating installment. And this is what you will be getting, Carol, uh, you and your bird, um, hopefully another bag uh, also of, of the fever food of your bird's choice. So let me see. I cannot get the volume to um, play on this, but um, we're going, uh, you're going to be getting a, a, the garden veggies. So um, there we go. It's the Nutriberry garden veggie variety. And it, 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 it kind of looks like spring to me. <laughs> that, was, that was wonderful. Um, vegetables. That's, 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 yeah, that's a good way to, um, get in some good nutrition 
and made on the Lefebvre farm. Um, and I believe it also has the uh, Omega. Yeah, doesn't it have the Omegas yeah. in there too? So there you go. We're talking about Omegas earlier and uh, you can get a serving of Omegas and the garden veggies. Um, all right, on that note, thank you. I know we're a little bit over time, but totally appreciate you going through a lot of questions. Uh, we still have more questions. Maybe we'll, we'll be able to present that or, or get an answer out to those who submitted um, some other, we have like 10 more questions that popped up during the webinar, but we'll, we'll see a way of uh, getting an answer to you on those. So on that note, Dr. Lamb, once again, thank you so much. Um, hope you have a wonderful uh, spring. Uh, we, I know spring's uh, break's coming up for a lot of people. Hope you have a chance to, for some downtime, you and Arroyo. <laughs> and Arroyo, thank you for being you in the background. That was, that was yeah. quite, you put on quite a show today. That was awesome. So yeah. on that <laughs> On that note, I'm going to say goodbye and everyone have a great weekend. Um, enjoy the sunny weather if it's in your parts and uh, all the best to you in your flock. Until next time, everyone stay safe. Bye.